If you've never heard of stick drift, you should count yourself lucky. Stick drift occurs when a couple of components inside your controller, the potentiometers, begin to wear and fail, and that causes the controller to register ghost input. Hall effect sticks like these are the obvious answer to this problem, but for some reason manufacturers refuse to use them. Except for that brief stint in 2006 when Sony used it in a subset of their DualShock 3 controllers. And that's really not acceptable, because at around $70 a pop, these controllers are far too expensive to last just three to six months. We've covered stick drift at length, and if you want to find out more, check out our videos and blog posts to find out why drift happens and why hole sensors are better. When your controller begins to drift, you really only have two options left to you. You can either buy a new controller and throw away the old one, or you can replace the potentiometer sticks in here with new potentiometer sticks and hope it doesn't start drifting again within six months. But now we've got an amazing third option. A couple of manufacturers recently released drop-in hole sensor sticks that work natively with the latest PlayStation, Xbox, and Nintendo controllers. While we wait for Sony, Microsoft, and Nintendo to get the hint, we're going to show you how to drift-proof your PS5 DualSense controller. Now these steps generally apply to the Nintendo and Xbox controllers too, just make sure you buy the correct thumbsticks for those controllers and follow the correct guides for your controller. We're going to have to extract the DualSense mainboard for this mod. It's not a difficult task, but remember to follow the guides on our website when you're doing your replacement. Also be aware that there are a few different versions of the DualSense controller, each with a slightly different internal layout. Make sure to follow the guide for your controller version. Insert an opening pick underneath the middle trim at the bottom of the controller to release the clip securing it to the case, and then lift it up and off. Using a spudger, pry out the R1 and L1 buttons, and then flip the controller stick side down, and remove the two screws at the bottom of the controller and the two screws at the top of the controller. Once the retaining screws are out, flip the controller over so the thumbsticks are pointing towards the table and slide a pick along the plastic seam to unclip the back cover. Disconnect the battery and remove it. With the battery out, go ahead and remove the trigger cables on each side of the board. Now disconnect the two microphone ribbon cables and remove the lower microphone from its housing. We're going to undo the screw holding the battery bracket in place and remove it. Then we're going to disconnect the touchpad cable at the top of the board. Here's where the fun begins. We need to desolder four points to disconnect the board from the rumble motors. This is lead-free solder, so it has a high melting point. I'm going to crank my iron up to 400C and apply a little flux to my copper braid to help the solder flow away from the board. With that, the board is now free and the thumbstick caps can be removed. Brace yourself, this part is a bit on the tricky side if you've never done it before. To begin, let's secure the board to free up both of our hands. There's a grand total of 14 pins we need to desolder. There are easier ways of doing this, but you'd need a reflow station or desoldering gun. We're showing you the method requiring the fewest, least expensive tools. It helps to understand the tricky part of what we're doing so you can tackle it effectively. The first issue is that these 14 solder points all connect to a single module, a thumbstick. Without a reflow station, it's not possible to melt all the solder points at the same time. This means we need to remove as much of the solder as possible. The other challenge is the lead-free solder, which has a relatively high melting point. You can easily melt the solder sitting on the surface, but the majority of the solder runs right through to the other side of the board. That makes heating and extracting that solder difficult with just an iron, which is exactly what happened to me here. Here's a trick I used. If you apply a lower melt point solder to the joint, say leaded solder with a melting point of 183C, the lead-free stuff that melts at 217C mixes with the leaded solder. That creates an alloy with a melting point somewhere between these two temperatures. The lower melt point on this alloy makes it much easier for the iron to heat the entire column of solder in each through hole joint. In this example here, I'm using a low melt solder containing bismuth. This definitely makes it easier to extract the solder, but be aware that some bismuth residue will remain regardless of how well you clean these pads. That might make the joints weaker than if you used leaded solder or some equivalent, but I personally didn't run into any issues here during testing. Oh, and don't worry about those burn marks. That's just the flux I applied to the copper braid. It cleans off with a bit of isopropyl alcohol. After cleaning the board and removing the residual solder, it's time to install our upgrade. With the new stick module installed, I'm applying flux to the contacts I want to solder. Standing the board upright with a soldering splint worked for me, but you can change the orientation of the board to suit your style. 
I want both my hands free for this, so I'm going to apply two temporary solder points to secure the module while I work my way around. If you find your solder balling on the iron instead of the joint like you see here, you might need to add more flux or allow the contact on the board to heat up a bit more. This isn't my best work, but it's gonna do. And there it is, our left thumbstick is now a drift resistant hole sensor stick. Before reassembling the device, clean any flux residue from the board using isopropyl alcohol. Flux, even the no-clean variety, can be a problem if left on the board. With the board cleaned, I'm going to replace the thumbstick caps, place the board back inside the housing, and reconnect the touchpad cable at the top. Our last soldering task is to reapply the rumble motor wires. If you haven't already, clean the pads and apply some flux. I'm going to throw a generous glob of solder on the pad, and with a pair of tweezers, I can apply heat to both the end of the wire and the glob of solder I just placed. You can pre-tin the rumble motor wires for a better connection. Repeat for the other two wires on the other rumble motor, but the job's not done till all the residual flux is gone. Now it's back to reassembling the components, starting with the battery housing, then the two microphones, and the two trigger cables. Next up is the battery pack, and once that's connected, I can replace the controller cover. All that's left now are the four screws and the R1 and L1 buttons, with the mid trim going in last. And there it is, the hardware side is done, and all that's left is to calibrate the thumbsticks. Now, unlike almost every other manufacturer out there, Sony does not release the software calibration for these things, so we're going to have to resort to a third-party solution. Do be warned, as the disclaimer states, this is at your own risk, and if done wrong, you risk breaking your controller. Take a look at the before and after results. The stick on the right is the stock potentiometer with a recalibrated error rate of around 6.1%, down from 7.6% before calibration. Our recalibrated hole sensor stick comes in at about 7.5%. Now unlike our stock potentiometer stick, the hole effect stick should remain at the 7.5% error rate indefinitely, long after the stock potentiometer stick has stopped working. The glaring question here is this, why are the big players in gaming controllers not adopting this tech? It's not new tech, we've seen Sony dabble in hole sensor sticks with the DualShock 3 back in 2006, and drone transmitters and industrial application joysticks have used hole sensors for decades for their increased durability. And while component cost is the most common excuse manufacturers use for not using hole effect sensor sticks in their controllers, adding $20 to a $75 controller is still way cheaper than paying $75 every single time one of these starts to drift. It's also significantly cheaper than paying $200 for a DualSense Edge that has replaceable thumbsticks. Thumbsticks that are perpetually out of stock. So do manufacturers just want to sell more controllers at our expense? Or are they just not putting enough time and money into redesigning their controllers? I don't know the answer to that question, but what I do know is that I'm holding a whole effect sensor DualSense controller that Sony doesn't want to make. Maybe it's time for manufacturers to stop making excuses and solve this problem once and for all.